Good afternoon. We'd like to begin by honoring the land in which MIT sits on. MIT acknowledges indigenous peoples as the traditional stewards of the land and the enduring relationship that exists between them and their traditional territories. The land on which we sit is a traditional unceded territory of the Wampanoag Nation. We acknowledge the painful history of genocide and forced occupation of their territory and we honor and respect the many diverse indigenous people connected to this land on which we gather from time immemorial. Indigenous peoples have always practiced the honoring of guests as well as their hosts when visiting other nations and communities. Thank you for joining us in this very important panel discussion. My name is Beatriz Cantara. I use a she pronoun series. I'm the Director of Engagement for Diversity and Inclusion in the Institute Community and Equity Office, or ICEO. I will now pass the virtual mic to our moderator, Professor Chris Capazzola. Chris, take it away. All right, thank you, Beatrice, uh, for gathering us and for that acknowledgement. Um, I am Chris Capazzola. I'm the head of history here at MIT, uh, and I have the uh, privilege of serving as the moderator for this evening's discussion on the history and impact of Asian American marginalization at MIT. Now, the, uh, the poster and the image that uh, advertised this evening's session included the names of so many departments and groups, uh, student, faculty, and staff groups here at MIT who have co-sponsored this event. Um, and I draw your attention to that um, rather than listing them all out by name, but many thanks um, to all of them, students, faculty, and st uh, staff for their endorsement and for your attendance today. The time that you took to log on uh, demonstrates the importance of the issues that we're discussing, visibility and intersectionality on our campus today and the endurance of these questions across a long span of history in the United States and abroad. We gather to inquire into the history and legacies of anti-Asian racism nationally and on our campus. We consider the tasks and opportunities of cross-community allyship and we ask, what are the spaces, resources, and institutional changes that are needed to dispel myths and advance equity for all? Now we'll begin with some comments from three faculty members who will bring brief insights from their academic disciplines to these urgent questions of visibility and intersectionality. After that, we've invited three additional members of the MIT community to engage in dialogue with our faculty presenters and to kick off our conversation. Then we'll open up to a broader discussion and Q&A uh, in which we welcome comments and questions from everyone joining us on this webinar. Uh, now, just a reminder uh, that, that the faculty presentations and opening comments here are being recorded and they will be shared with the MIT community and transcription will be available uh, for the recorded portion of this evening's conversation. After the initial presentations are over, we will turn off the recording um, and, won't, and will not be recording or transcribing those, those portions of our conversation. Now, let me just introduce our, our first three speakers. Um, first joining us, um, Emma Tang is the TT and Wei Fong Chow Professor of Asian Civilizations and a McVicker Faculty Fellow here at MIT. She holds a dual appointment in history and in global languages where she currently serves as the director. She'll be followed after that by Lily L. Tsai, who is the Ford Professor of Political Science and the Director of the MIT Governance Lab. She's also the Chair-Elect of the MIT faculty. And then third, we'll hear from Professor Craig Stephen Wilder, who is the Barton L. Weller Professor of History here at MIT, the author uh, of Ebony and Ivy, Race, Slavery, and the Troubled History of American Universities, he teaches an undergraduate research uh, class on MIT and slavery um, and will be joining us as our third faculty presenter today. Um, I'll turn it over to them now. And then after that, I'll introduce our three additional speakers. So first, Professor Tang. Thank you so much, Chris, for the introduction. I'm going to um, share my screen. And I'd like to also really thank the ICEO and all the other organizers of this panel. So I'm going to give some background remarks about the model minority myth and how it's misleading. Why does that matter? And what can we do about it is the question I'll have for the group. 
So to give some brief background, Asians have been widely considered a model minority since the 1960s with high educational attainment, high median family income, low poverty and low crime rates. I think we're all familiar with that myth. But I want to offer an important corrective that Asian Americans or the AAPI community is very diverse and a different picture really emerges when we disaggregate the data. So I think many in the audience are familiar with this, but I'll just go through quickly, right? Based on uh, research done by the Pew Research Center, they've shown that the US Asian population overall does well on measures of economic well being compared with the US population as a whole, but this actually varies very widely among Asian subgroups. So if we look at Asian Americans as a general category sort of lumped together, the median annual household income is higher than the average for all US households. And Asian Americans are overall less likely than the general US population to live in poverty. However, when we break it down by the sub-ethnic groups, we can see that there's a very, very wide range among the groups from higher on the scale of average household income to lower on that scale. And in terms of poverty rates as well, the differences among Asian subgroups is very broad. Eight out of the 19 Asian groups analyzed had poverty rates that are actually higher than the US average. Educational attainment, we can similarly see a very different picture when we break down the different groups. Whereas lumping all Asians together, we see that 51% of Asians aged 25 and older have a bachelor's degree or more compared with 30% of all Americans that age. In fact, if we compare Indians who have the highest level of educational attainment among Asian Americans with other groups such as Cambodians, Hmong, Laotians and Bhutanese, again, we see very, very divergent picture emerging. So why does this matter? Um, a lot of people have talked about, is there any benefits in fact to this model minority myth or stereotype? And Philip Guo, who graduated from MIT, he's an alum, wrote a very moving essay about technical privilege. He talked about how the stereotype of Asian male students as being very facile or good with computer science benefited him, he felt, relative to his female peers and URM peers in the same classes, right? So there's a stereotype that enabled him, though he was not at all versed in computer science when he came to MIT, to, in his own words, fake it until he could make it. And he heard comments like that, you know, he mentioned that he never heard anyone say, well, you only got into MIT because you're an Asian boy. So that's technical privilege. But on the flip side, there are other knock-on effects that are not so positive. The first I would say is it's easy to slide from model minority to invisible minority. So for example, when I was looking at this recent um, article in the New York Times about the pandemic's racial disparities, we can see here that communities of color, they mentioned that the vaccination rate for black people in the United States is half that of white people and the gap for Hispanic people is even larger. But where are Asian Americans in this picture? We're literally invisible. So the phenomenon of the invisible minority leads to various things such as a lack of data, lack of attention in policy issues, public health research, social services, et cetera, uneven inclusion in affirmative action measures and lack of attention to experiences of discrimination harassment and violence. Asian Americans can often be overlooked in clinical research and this leads to understudied health disparity issues as well if grant making agencies may not consider Asian Americans as so-called at-risk group. And there are barriers to mental health and support services that are not well addressed. In fact, Asian Americans are less likely to use mental health services than any other racial group. This invisibility came to a head for me with the Atlanta mass shooting, which brought a lot of visibility in the mainstream media 
to the phenomenon of anti-Asian violence and many people reached out to me. However, it brings us back to the fact that this kind of anger against Asian Americans and harassment since the advent of coronavirus has been dating back a very long time and hasn't been very visible in the press until the Atlanta mass shootings. In fact, according to Stop AAPI Hate National Report, uh, between March 2020 and February 2021, there were nearly 4,000 reported anti-Asian hate incidents, and these may in fact be underreported. How does this take place in terms of institutional structures? What about institutional visibility? At MIT, we have the Margaret Cheney Room, we have the BSU Lounge, and we have the Latino Cultural Center. But where is a space where Asian Americans and AAPI become visible institutionally? The model minority syndrome can also lead to imposter syndrome, and that's the flip side of technical privilege. I hear a lot of students talk about the so-called Asian fail, which means an A minus. And whereas that's sometimes taken as a kind of joke, it does put an enormous amount of pressure on Asian American students who are not achieving at that level, who struggle with their schoolwork or other aspects of their educational life. And I've heard students label themselves to me as a bad Asian, you know, if they're not breezing through all their classes. Whereas in reality, we all know that being an MIT student is enormously challenging for everybody, regardless of your background. There can also be bullying in school and mental health effects that are not very well addressed because sometimes the response in schools is that, well, your kids are doing well and they don't have problems, so let's not worry about it. Um, and in, you know, in line with this difficulty of the imposter syndrome, many campuses lack mental health services with culturally appropriate knowledge and that can be a barrier to addressing this imposter syndrome. The model minority myth can also be very much an obstacle to solidarity. And how do we see that in the MIT campus setting? If we look at the MIT facts here above, right, we can see that um, US minority groups actually make up 51% of undergraduates for the fall 2019 enrollment, which is extremely impressive. But on the other hand, according to the MIT report on race in 2010, they offered this definition. At MIT and most other STEM institutions, the underrepresented minority refers to those minority groups that are not represented in the STEM fields in numbers proportional to their composition in the US population which would not include the Asian group. So sometimes it's confusing for Asian Americans, AAPI, to know where we belong. Sometimes we're visible as minorities and sometimes we're not visible. So where are we in the picture? And that can lead, uh, just to wrap up on the solidarity, that can lead, I think, to a lot of misunderstandings and lost opportunities for solidarity, which is, I think, a topic that Professor Wilder and I have discussed at much length. So finally, I'd like to wrap up by mentioning that the model minorities myth can also perpetuate the bamboo ceiling. The bamboo ceiling comes about because model minority qualities are often not seen as consistent with so-called leadership skills. So a study that was posted in the Harvard Business Review in December 2016 described a range of studies on Asians and leadership. And these studies showed that Asians tend to rate unfavorably against both whites and backs in terms of their leadership qualities. It's a paradox because Asians are seen as particularly high on competence. They're seen as successful and intelligent. So that's the model minority myth but at the same time, they are seen as low on social skills. In other words, nerdy or antisocial. 
So that's where I would like to conclude by mentioning that the bamboo ceiling, I think, can be seen in many different kinds of contexts where Asians are recognized as competent, intelligent, and high achieving, but not possessing the social or leadership skills to be put in um, high leadership positions. And I think we can reflect on that a little bit in our own institutional context here at MIT. So thank you so much. I'll stop my share. Beatrice, shall I? Oh, Chris. Lily, go ahead. Yes. Great. Thank you. Um, so thank you very, very much to the Department of History and the ICO office for um, holding this event, organizing this event. Um, I feel especially privileged to be on this panel. Um, first, because I'm a political scientist um, amongst um, August historians. Um, so um, I'm actually going to um, limit my comments to, um, in a way, more individual reflections, um, as I'm also not a scholar of um, these issues um, as Emma and Craig are. Um, Instead, I thought I would use my time um, again to offer some individual reflections on the potential bases for Asian and Black solidarity um, that um, are um, based a little bit on you know, what I do study and um, what I have read as a political scientist. Um, so you know, in reflecting on challenges to mobilization of Asian American Pacific Islander um, populations, um, you know, there are, I think, challenges both to forming coalitions within the AAPI um, population. Um, first, you know, we just have limited numbers nationally. Um, we make up, you know, merely five or six percent of the U.S. population. And within that five or six percent, there's an enormous diversity, um, as Emma um, drew our attention to, um, both of um, economic income level, um, educational attainment, um, and then also a diversity of um, immigrant generations in, in, in the sense that um, there are seventh, eighth generation Asian American um, communities, but also um, first generation or new immigrants. Um, and this can be a particular challenge because of the um, increasing xenophobia that we're seeing um, in American society um, um, currently. So, so there are big challenges uh, to forming coalitions within the Asian American Pacific Islander community. There are also significant challenges to forming coalitions with other groups. Um, so, you know, that's exacerbated by the increasing xenophobia and um, um, increasing conflict between the US and China over economic and security issues. Um, but it is also, I think, um, complicated by the fact um, that, um, and here I'm gonna draw on the work of a colleague um, in political science at UC Irvine, Claire Kim. Um, Claire uh, posits this racial triangulation theory, which um, I have found um, to be very helpful in terms of making sense of how the model minority and perpetual foreigner myths um, in some sense contradict each other yet um, coexist. Um, and I also find it very useful for understanding um, the challenges and um, by through understanding the challenges, understanding the opportunities for black Asian solidarity. So um, here is a um, summary diagram of um, this theory of racial triangulation. And um, here I want to acknowledge that um, um, a colleague of mine, Henri Wheeler, who is a local um, equity educator and consultant, um, was very helpful in finding this hand-drawn version of the diagram. Um, so um, just to explain a little bit, um, Kim posits that, um, you know, we typically think of um, white, Asian American, and Black groups arrayed on this vertical axis. Um, which um, she describes as relative valorization. That is to say that, um, you know, there is this axis of superiority and inferiority. Um, whites are at the top, Asian Americans are in the middle as the model minority and blacks are at the bottom. Um, and that helps, you know, explain um, 
a certain amount um, of why Asian Americans are able to be utilized as um, a wedge. Um, but in order to fully understand um, the dynamics um, of, uh, between these three groups, there is also this second dimension um, on the horizontal axis between foreigner and insider. And here, um, this helps us understand how Asian Americans and why Asian Americans are often conceptualized as the perpetual foreigner, as Emma pointed out. Um, you know, where white and black American groups are insiders, Asian Americans are considered outsiders. Um, and, um, and I think that understanding this particular triangle is important um, because again, it enables us to see how Asian Americans can be used as a wedge um, between whites and blacks and um, how uh, there can be challenges uh, to Asian American and black solidarity. Um, so, um, you know, some of the history around um, racial triangulation um, has to do with um, the original um, uh, use of immigrant Chinese labor in California. Um, white business and political elites in California elected to enter the United States as a quote, free or non-slave state. Um, but the economic boom there required cheap labor. Um, in order to square this circle, uh, California elites solved the problem by using Chinese immigrant labor while minimizing their demands on the polity so that um, this Chinese immigrant labor was apolitical non-citizens, um, you know, only temporarily in the United States. Um, you know, it was not uncommon to see these kinds of statements that were um, this kind of relative valorization. White, one, one white man is worth two Chinamen, one Chinaman is worth two Negroes. Um, and also um, civic ostracism. ostracism. Um, and we can see this in the anti-Chinese exclusion movement of the 1870s, the anti-Japanese exclusion movement of the early 1900s, as well as the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II. Um, in more recent years, um, we continue to see this kind of racial triangulation um, manifest itself in um, the Reagan era policies in the 1980s and their emphasis on um, color blindness. Um, it was you know, pretty common for the rhetoric um, in that era to really focus on how you know, color was irrelevant, that um, you know, we should be aspiring to a kind of color blindness. Um, we can also see it in the debates around um, university admissions um, that, have, that started in the 1990s and have um, continued, um, that uh, there is this reframing of um, you know, potential white discrimination against Asian Americans in university admissions, for example, and instead of framing it as um, the potential racial quotas that may exist, um, it has been reframed to really um, utilize this racial triangulation and talk about the quote, reverse discrimination against Asian Americans in affirmative action. Um, these kinds of reframings really shift the attention from white versus non-white conflict over resources to Asian Americans versus quote, underrepresented minorities. So how does, I mean, here I wanna talk just for a minute or two on um, how this helped me to reflect on the potential for black Asian solidarity. Um, you know, any kind of solidarity will require all groups um, to really think about um, the anti-blackness within each group um, as, um, you know, some of you have usefully pointed out um, to me. And I think that that is an incredibly important point for all of us to keep in mind. Um, as I think about how Asian Americans can be allies for black Americans, um, this concept of racial triangulation, um, I think brings to the fore that Asian Americans really need to fight um, the myth that no amount of externally imposed hardship can keep a good minority down. Um, that um, you know, the, there are these myths that um, really focus on the internal and cultural sources of success for um, Asian Americans as a model minority, and um, and I think it's important 
it has been important for me to become aware that um, any emphasis on these kinds of internal or, or cultural sources of su success really shift attention away from external structural sources um, that may be just as, if not more important. I think for me in reflecting on the civic ostracism that um, racial triangulation produces, um, I think it has also become um, clear to me that it's important to make sure that um, political mobilization is not um, seen or um, spoken about or conceived as the quote, lazy way of advancing economically in the sense of asking for redistributive policies or the unseemly way in the sense that um, as the model minority Asian Americans, um, you know, succeed because or um, as long as they keep their heads down and um, are not mobilized and are, you know, relatively apolitical. Um, but, um, you know, these are again, um, some of my individual reflections as really a non-expert on these issues. And I look forward to hearing um, the discussion and the questions from all of you, uh, and as well as, you know, potential suggestions. So thank you. Thank you, and now we'll turn to uh, Craig Wilder. First, I just wanna thank everyone for the invitation to join you. Um, this is actually a um, honor for me to actually join my two colleagues in having this discussion. Excuse me, I struggled a bit in trying to figure out where I should begin with this talk, this presentation. And then I realized that the beginning point was on the sort of front page of every newspaper in the United States. And the image that you're looking at right now is an image um, from the Los Angeles Times in which they went back recently to look at um, one of the anti-Chinese riots, um, homicidal anti-Chinese riots of the 1870s. Our colleague at Columbia, May Nye, recently published an essay, an editorial in the Atlantic in which she pointed out that the invisibility of anti-Chinese violence and the invisibility of Asian Americans and American political discourse um, is not an accident. And if we go back and think about the history of um, anti-Asian violence, anti-Asian politics and Chinese exclusion, we'll actually start to understand how central um, those phenomena were to the making of the modern United States. One of the things that May did is she drew a parallel between the anti-Asian um, and Chinese exclusion movements and Jim Crow in the South. I'd actually like to begin there and take May's point, her argument a bit further, um, because I actually think one of the things that's also missing from these conversations, especially when we had these conversations on campus, is the centrality of American colleges and universities to the rise of the racial civilization that we so often study. Universities and colleges were not innocent institutions that sat in the backdrop of American history and just observed it. They were active participants in crafting that history and in crafting the racial legacies of that past. Because they were debated in the language of race, some of the greatest social questions of the 19th century actually hold colleges, universities, university faculty, and scholars um, into the political realm. And in fact, actually, that's probably too polite. American college faculty actually chased those political opportunities. The scientific pursuit of race, um, the attempt of scientists and academics to provide race with an academic veneer, to take what was in fact a set of social questions and provide an intellectual um, covering for them, actually led to the rising prestige of the university in the 19th century. And so if we think about um, Chinese exclusion as one of the culminating events, I would actually suggest that some of the earlier events were um, rooted in things like the Indian Removal Act of 1830. And I'll try and make this connection very quickly. Um, Indian removal, the pressure for Indian removal actually began almost as soon as Jefferson took office in 1801, Thomas Jefferson. Um, his successors actually dealt with the same issue and it was rooted in a basic sort of um, tension. The expanding cotton economy and, and plantation economy of the American South from 1800 through the 1830s actually created increasing pressure um, on Southern land and went to go past the 1830s. By the time James Madison took office in 1809, 
there was increased pressure to dispossess the southeastern Indian nations. Um, by the time James Monroe took office in 1817, um, Monroe was actually, the federal government was, was really in fact positioning itself to become one of the agents of Indian removal. The 1830 Indian Removal Act authorized the federal government to treat with Indian nations to exchange lands in the East for territories west of the Mississippi River. Um, and the United States government used in fact coercion, manipulation and violence um, to enact those policies. There was a debate that happened around Indian removal right um, in Massachusetts. In 1830, Senator um, Edward Everett, I'm sorry, Congressman Edward Everett of Massachusetts, who's a future president of Harvard, signed a copy of a speech from his colleague, Senator Theodore Frelinghuysen of New Jersey, a future president of Rutgers University. And he sent that copy of the speech to Harvard librarian, John Langdon Sibley. The two Northerners actually agreed, these two sort of um, Northern intellectuals, politicians agreed that um, the removal of the Cherokee was immoral. Who urges this plea? Senator Frelinghuysen asked. And his answer was, they who covet the Indian land. By the time Andrew Jackson took office, the complete removal of Indians to areas beyond white settlement um, was the goal of the United States government. And in fact, um, Jackson pursued that goal with such viciousness that his 1834 visit to the Harvard campus caused quite a bit of controversy. Um, it wasn't clear whether or not the public could and should protest the arrival of a president visiting a college campus but that 1834 visit actually reminds us how central colleges were and universities were to race making in the 19th century world. Um, at the very moment when the colonization society was reaching the, uh, I'm sorry, the um, Indian Removal Act was um, being enacted, the American colonization society was reaching the peak of its influence and power. And the reason I wanna talk about the ACS for a minute, the colonization society is actually that in the 1830s, as Indian removal is playing out in the South, the colonization society is actually um, reaching the height of its influence. And it, the height of its influence comes at a moment when the former president of the United States, James Madison, is now the president of the colonization society. The colonization society was actually established in 1816, 1817, with the aim of removing free black people to some site outside the United States. This is Madison's um, membership certificate in the ACS, and it's signed by Bushrod Washington, um, the Supreme Court Justice. And I wanna remind us, if you take a moment to just point out how influential this group of people who back colonization are. Their goal is to remove the free black population from the United States. There's a less, lesser sort of acknowledged aim of removing, in fact, the black population to some point outside the United States. In the 1830s, the Colonization Society is at the peak of its influence when Madison is president, but his vice president is actually Jeremiah Day, um, Day the Reverend Jeremiah Day, the president of Yale University um, and an influential academic. The, I actually think that those connections matter a lot to us because we have to remember that the rise of the American university, the influence of the American university increased, it occurred at the very moment that these racial projects were actually taking over the United States. And American intellectuals from the 1820s through the 1830s, to the 40s, the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s were central to providing a kind of intellectual and academic justification for campaigns against various communities of people of color and campaigns against other religious groups. One of the things that's often forgotten is that almost at the same moment that the American Colonization Society was being established in Washington, DC, um, another organization was being established um, in New York City. In 1816, a group of New Yorkers with connections, connections to Columbia University came together to establish the American Society for Evangelizing the Jews. That organization later became the American Society for Ameliorating the Condition of the Jews. Um, but I just wanna take a minute to talk about what they did. Quote, in taking leave of the society, I heartily pray that it may be instrumental in promoting the spiritual and temporal welfare of that ancient and wonderful people whose present infidelity is among the strongest evidences of the re religion they reject. 
Peter Augustus Jay wrote that in 1822 upon resigning as the director and treasurer of the American Society. A trustee of Columbia College, Jay had also headed the New York Manumission Society, which was established to govern New York's process for ending um, enslavement. And, um, and he was uh, presiding over the um, Manumission Society when it was lobbying Congress to use the funds from the sale of public lands to pay for the transportation of Africans, African-Americans to someplace outside the United States. In an age of racial cleansing, the American Society for Ameliorating the Condition of the Jews funded efforts to Christianize American Jews and to send the, un, um, the Jews who refused um, to convert to someplace outside the United States. For those who actually did convert, the vision of the American Society was that it would actually relocate them to effectively to reservations um, on American land. In 1823, John Robert Murray, another Columbia trustee, brokered an agreement with Jacob Van Rensselaer and Hezekiah Pierpont, two of New York's wealthiest men, to um, endow the association by transferring land, some of their lands to the association with the purpose of actually relocating converted Jews to these sort of isolated spaces where they could perfect their Christianity and also to, to be um, supervised. If one actually takes those various movements and takes them seriously, one of the things I just want to um, remind the audience of is that all of them actually had a significant academic presence in them. In fact, actually the rise of the American University in the 19th century can actually be tracked by looking at the rise of anti-Asian, anti-Black, anti-Indian, and anti-Semitic logics and campaigns in the United States. The American College and the American University were always, in fact, closely tied to those campaigns. And in many ways, American colleges and universities really, in fact, in some ways, had to be. Um, the American University actually benefited directly from removal campaigns. American universities benefited directly financially from the expansion of plantation slavery. And it was, in fact, the success of, of campaigns like, for example, Indian removal that gave many Americans the, the um, confidence to believe that they can engage in campaigns to racially and religiously purify the United States, a, a twisted sort of perverse vision of the future that actually survived well into the 20th century. When we think about, in fact, um, anti-Asian sentiment on American campuses, one of the things that we actually need to do is not only think about the relationship between those historical campaigns and relationships, um, that twisted history of the 19th century and its 20th century inheritance, we also actually have to be honest about the way in which higher education, American colleges and universities actually participated in those campaigns, benefited from those campaigns. Our institutions were in fact, in fact never innocent actors sitting in the backdrop of history um, this is your, the founder of the eugenics movement that you're looking at right now. And in some ways, actually, it was precisely the eugenics movement on campuses in the, both in the United States and in Europe um, that coincides with some of the most aggressive moments of the anti-Asian campaigns in the United States um, and Canada. Um, the, the, the two go hand in hand. And the American University, the American College, um, actually benefited directly, participated directly in them. And I think we have a moment where we have to really think about how we hold ourselves accountable and how these institutions today need not just to repair that past, but also to envision a future that's far more democratic, far more inclusive and far less divided. Thank you. All right, so I want to uh, just issue a, a big round of uh, virtual applause uh, to our first three panelists, um, and I'm sure everyone watching uh, will join me. Um, so thank you for your, your scholarship and analysis, um, your reflections, um, and your calls for honesty and accountability.